Hello, yes, my name is Caroline Cochran, and I'm here to talk to you today about the environment, guilt, and actually doing something. So maybe like many people, I learned about many environmental issues through actually film. So it, that was actually occurring here at the University of Oklahoma a number of years ago. Al Gore actually came and screened his film, The Inconvenient Truth. And that was the first time, even though I was raised to kind of think about conservation and the environment, that I really learned some facts about the dire situation that we find ourselves in today. I also have since then been interested in that topic and watched other environmental films. And as a co-founder of a startup, I actually was part of an environmental film myself. And it was through visiting different environmental film festivals, screening that film, that I got even more feedback about how people are listening to these films and how they're learning about this and engaging with the topic of the environment and what we should do. And one of the things I noticed coming up to me after the screenings, people would say, yours was the first film that I felt like actually I provided some sort of answer. Like after, one after another, I watched these films that just made me feel bad. Um, so I started thinking about what, it, what is going on there and, and how can we improve that? And I realized that a lot of films actually follow a similar thread. So the first step might be, let's make sure everyone has awareness about an issue. Um, so that of itself might be an end, but usually it was sort of like, Hopefully they're aware, and then hopefully they feel guilty. Um, and guiltiness almost seemed like an end. Um, not the actual goal, but just actually what you're supposed to feel at the end of this. Sometimes they would take them in the next step, which is ideal, is, okay, you, you're aware, you feel guilty, and now um, let's all try to do this one small thing. And if we all just do this one small thing, we'll, it'll add up to a measurable impact. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I want to illustrate some of the difficulties that arise out of that line of thinking. Different examples might be like, oh, you know, I saw films about um, how palm oil harvesting is affecting elephants and orangutans and really became aware of that issue at one of these environmental film festivals. But let's take a more concrete example and actually walk through it. So straws. My guess is when I just say the word or show some of these pictures, it's exciting kind of a, some kind of response out of you, either anger or sadness or irrelevance. Um, and what we're seeing here is we're creating division through the way we're talking about an issue. On the positive side, we might say, OK, here is an issue where it's relatively easy for most of us not to use a straw to actually sip out of a cup. And it's maybe one of the simplest ways we can reduce single-use plastic. And if we all do this, we can actually make a miserable impact. On the other side of the coin, I think deep down a lot of us realize that with many of these pet issues, we actually feel like, if I just do this one thing, will it actually make that much of a difference? And really, there's this huge world out there, let alone our own country, and we really feel like maybe it doesn't actually make that much of a difference, and many people actually begin to resent that feeling or even feel angry about being made to feel that way about one small issue. So we're creating this emotional division, right? So some people are at least feeling guilty, and they feel like, well, at least that shows I'm not a bad person, because I might be doing this or doing that. Um, but I'm definitely feeling guilty about it, so that means I'm not a terrible person. Um, on the flip side, there might be people who are like, hey, if you look at the big scheme of things, this isn't as big a deal as that, and I'm not doing that, and so why should people make me feel guilty about this? So I'm going to go ahead and do it with pride, because you know, other people don't know what they're talking about. So we're creating this emotional division between people on a topic that's relatively unnecessary. We're also creating an economic division. This is maybe one of the most disturbing. I think there, there become these lines across people who have more resources and less resources where, and I've seen this before, where people are sitting around and saying, well, I don't use fossil fuels because I drive a Tesla and I pay the utility for more expensive electricity. Um, on the flip side, people with less resources who can't afford those find their own reasons to justify what they do in their lives. But everyone seems to feel like they need to make some sort of justification because this is such a big topic that we all basically care about. So in the end, this is making things worse. We're creating divisions across people that can make a difference, or we're creating divisions within the broader globe, honestly. We're leaving out large portions of the world that basically don't have the resources to make decisions, if you think about it, uh, the developed world, on average, a person in the developed world actually consumes about 10 times more than a person in the developing world. So the people with the most resources are trying to dictate to the rest of the world what they should be doing. 
And we're creating division in the part of the world where we actually do have the resources. So let's take a deep breath and think about this a little bit. Is there something that we know of that's a big chunk out of the apple of fighting this issue that we all kind of agree on is let's save the environment for our future and for our children. I would say that there is a big solution out there. And there are countries that have deeply decarbonized their power sector quickly. Now, granted, power sector isn't all the emissions, and emissions aren't all the environmental problems out there. But this is a big chunk of a big pie that we can all play a part in. And how did that actually occur? Okay, so this has actually happened. You can look at, there's eight countries that have deeply decarbonized their grid that are developed nations with good qualities of life, and the biggest of which is France. And within just about 20 years, France decarbonized their grid 86% reductions in their emissions. And how do they do that? They actually did a large scale up of nuclear power. A lot of these countries, in addition to nuclear power, they scale up their renewables. It kind of depends on the region, what makes the most sense. But there is this incredible ability to do this really rapidly through using this power source. One of the reasons why you can deeply decarbonize quickly is because the life cycle carbon emissions of nuclear is actually one of the lowest, if not the lowest, with all things considered, of different energy sources. So you see it's there down toward the bottom um, of the list. And another thing to consider, basically what's in the, all the fine print on the side there, is saying this considers mining, you know, production of energy, disposal, but it's not including backup power sources. So if you're using a power source like wind or solar, things that can go out at night or when it's not windy, you're going to have to have other sources in addition to that, like a natural gas or batteries and so forth, that themselves will have their own carbon footprint. So if you try to assess only one piece of the puzzle, you're not getting the full picture. But in any case, even without that considered, nuclear has a very low life cycle carbon emissions, and, and that's important to know. It also is able to use incredibly much less land. So if you see here on the chart, you see how much land it takes to produce the same amount of electricity per year um, between different power sources. Why is this possible? Well, a large part of the reason is because of the incredible energy density of the atom when it's fissioned. So the fission reaction itself has on the order of a million times more energy density than other chemical reactions that we're familiar with. So like burning fossil fuels or, uh, you know, calorie count is actually a measure of heat output of something. So that's why you see there sugar, coal, fat, and gasoline, and then uranium, and it's kind of shown that it would loop around many times to be on the order of millions of times more energy dense. One way to think about this is, is if your entire life cycle, lifespan's um, amount of power was put into a single spot using nuclear power, it would actually be about the size of a, a pop can, um, and that would be your entire lifespan required at, powered at normal um, American energy use, which is actually very high. So that'd be all of it. So the next question is, is what about safety? And I think this is a big topic that people are unfamiliar with or are scared about. Um, and one thing is, is we all have kind of this common issue of dealing with deaths worldwide due to pollution from different emitting sources. So it's important to keep in mind that worldwide, every year, we're losing about 6 million people that we believe are directly attributable to pollution-related causes. That's the biggest goal, is that is our com everyone's common goal, is to reduce that amount, right? We want less pollution and cleaner air for ourselves and for the globe. You can see here, everything has its risks, right? Um, comparatively, there's going to be something for everything. Even solar and wind might have situations where installations or different situations occur that cause injury or death. So we have to be smart about assessing different resources we have and trying to make the best use of all of the different inputs we have. One of the big questions I get when talking about this is like, okay, well, if it's so great, then why haven't I heard about it? I think there's a lot of reasons for that we don't have enough time to go through right now. But I think part of it is it plays to natural human fears of things that we don't understand and can't see. We drive our cars every day. We're familiar with internal combustion engines. There's different things we're exposed to every day, our natural gas stoves. Even solar panels, many may have on the roof or a solar panel uh, cell phone charger or something like that. Um, but what you can't see is the atom, and you can't see this fission reaction it creates this natural human fear. There's also been special interests, I believe, that have really played a part in trying to downplay the ability to use that and play it up on these human fears. 
But at the end of the day, I want to say that there is a roadmap for something that we can do here. We can do something really big just like France did globally. And if you stop listening here, that would be fine. But I also want to talk about there's even more that's happened since then, okay? So the nuclear power you see in the United States and generally around the world essentially was developed in the 1960s and 70s. There's almost nothing you might use today that is around that old without any substantive changes. So there's been a lot that's happened since then. Since then, there's actually been advanced fission technologies that use the fission reaction, but in totally different ways. And they've demonstrated being able to shut down naturally, so no meltdown occurring. They've been able to demonstrate actually using waste as fuel, so taking nuclear waste and turning it into clean energy. And they even can do load following more dynamically, so they can work better on a grid with renewables and even on microgrids where they may not have any other source and it has to dynamically accommodate that grid. So why hasn't anyone heard about this? I think it goes back to the same issues we've found with nuclear power more broadly, but fission technologies themselves, I think some of the most dramatic tests that occurred on them actually occurred right before Chernobyl. Of course, Chernobyl is the only nuclear accident worldwide that has demonstrated deaths, and, and that dominated the news for quite a while in the 80s and has continued to be a part of the national conversation. So what happened at these tests? Actually, there was this advanced fission uh, generator, and it was able to, they took it and basically had it at full power, shut off all the cooling, made sure all of its shutdown mechanisms were turned off, and just waited to see what would happen. And it shut itself down through natural physics. Physical phenomena actually caused that to shut down. It's very interesting technology. Also, it proved this same reactor, it's not just talk, it actually took nuclear waste and used it, recycled it. So it's becoming essentially a renewable. So it actually demonstrated recycling nuclear waste and using it as a clean power fuel. So moving forward, the, the message is there are proven and implemented solutions that we can make use of. They're big solutions and not just hope that if each of us do some little thing, we'll have some little chunk out of a little pie. There are actually really big chunks of big pies that we can all address together. There's a part you can play in education. In short, we're facing an existential crisis for whole ecosystems. I think one of the most sobering statistics I've ever heard is in my lifetime since I was a kid, they're estimating there's roughly half of the species left that there were when I was a child. That's incredible to think about, and we want to do things as quickly as possible to stop that. There is one way that com whole countries in Western, you know, Western developed countries have actually dramatically reduced their emissions from the power sector, and that's through dramatic scale-up of nuclear power and also through use of renewables. We can actually do this on a large scale worldwide in different countries at the rate needed to avoid dr truly dramatic collapse. On top of that, there are fission technologies. We don't have to do this the way it was done 70 years ago. We can do this using advanced fission that will have all these benefits and improve safety and the environment even further. Advanced fission is actually all, already one of the most bipartisan issues in Congress, which is an incredible thing in this divided world. And we're actually at a time in history where we're seeing so many different social movements take hold and make a difference very rapidly. I almost call them euphemistically like hashtag movements, but I think we can all play a part in that. And even small parts can lead to big parts through that by actually being a part of, like I said, education and awareness of this issue and supporting different technologies that are out there. So we can all make a difference and this is critical and thank you for having me talk to you about this today.